Our search for the Leviathan of the cold Arctic seas, the bowhead whale, began over the sea ice along the extreme northern shores of Alaska. It was a two-pronged assault, with four of us searching by helicopter, while our other five men attempted to reach the edge of the Sharfast ice to set up camp and wait for the whales to swim by on their northern migration. The expedition was by no means the first to go in search of the bowhead whale. As long as 300 years ago, men ventured deep into the Arctic in great sailing ships to hunt the whale. The white men's voracious appetite for the oil of the bowhead decimated the whale population. In 1914, the last ship returned home from the Arctic whaling grounds empty. Now, 60 years later, the latest in modern technology was to be employed in an attempt to find out something about this gigantic creature that was brought so close to the edge of extinction. The success of the expedition pretty well depended on the flying and navigational skills of Jim Quakenbush, our pilot engineer. The guy in charge of the expedition was Scott McVeigh, a man with a passion for whales and a deep concern for this vanishing species of life. Bill Mason's my name and I'm looking after the filming except for the underwater shooting. The still photography and sound recording was Chess Beachell's department. We knew that somewhere those whales were out there. Now our job was to find and film them from the air while the ice crew tried to work their way to the edge of the Sharfast ice. Their objective was to set up camp on the edge of the ice and wait for the bowhead whales to swim by on their northern migration. Our Eskimo guide was Homer Bodfish, a whale hunter from Wainwright. Our plan was to get our divers into the water right in the path of the whales and attempt to film them. Rick Mason was one of the guys crazy enough to give it a try, along with Dr. Joe McInnes, a specialist in Arctic diving under the ice. Mark Kanishi is a biologist with a particular interest in analyzing the whale's voice, if they have one. Steve Katona is also a biologist studying zooplankton, but the only guy who was really at home out here was Homer. It was his job to see that we didn't all drift out to sea when the ice started breaking up, and we had no idea when that might be. We only knew that somewhere, out there, whales were moving northward, and our only hope of making contact was to find open water. Nobody knows exactly where the bowhead whale goes in summer, or where it spends the winter. But we do know that every spring as the ice in the Bering Straits between Russia and Alaska begins to break open, the whales follow the ever-widening leads to the plankton-rich Arctic Ocean. It's a dangerous journey for the bowhead because their passage along the narrow coastal lead brings them within reach of the only enemy they have. Oh, 
For thousands of years, the Eskimo has set up camp along the edge of the Sharfast ice to hunt the whale from their fragile skin boats. Even today, the hunt is still very much a part of the Eskimo's culture. Now this bowhead is very small compared to the gigantic 60-foot whales that are occasionally killed. This one measured 25 feet and would weigh 15 to 20 tons. When the kill is made, the flag of the triumphant captain is struck and the whole village turns out to take part in the job of pulling the whale up onto the ice and cutting it up. The bowhead is a baleen whale, not a toothed whale like the beluga or sperm whale. To feed, it opens its mouth and the water goes in the front and rushes out the sides through the plates of baleen suspended from the upper jaw. The hair on the inside edges of the baleen forms a thick mat which collects the plankton organisms, especially krill and copepods. When the immense jaws are closed, the remaining food is then swallowed. <laughs> the Eskimos work with a practiced efficiency, knowing that a shift in the wind could quickly bury the carcass under tons of rafting ice. <laughs> Although the bowhead is listed as an endangered species, the Eskimos are allowed to take what they can. Nobody knows for sure how the hunt is affecting the bowhead's chances of survival as a species. But the white man is hardly in a position to take away such an important part of the Eskimos' cultural heritage. It was, after all, our ancestors that brought the bowhead to the edge of extinction by what we like to think of as a superior technology. While somewhat primitive by today's standards, the great whaling ships of the 18th century could sail the oceans of the world in pursuit of the slower, easier to kill whales, such as the bowhead, right, and sperm. were lost in the perilous hunt. Their boats capsized or smashed by the whale in the agony of its death throes. But still the ships came in ever-increasing numbers in their quest for the liquid gold. The head of the sperm whale was so saturated with oil that it could be baled directly from a cavity in the severed head. 
The rest of the blubber was suctioned and boiled on deck. Ships aglow at night on the ocean were an indication of a successful hunt. Fortunes were made until the end of the 19th century when the ships returned home with empty holds. The bowhead and right whale were all but gone, leaving only the sperm whale. As the age of sail gave way to the age of steam power, the second era of the whaling industry began. The larger and faster whales, such as the blue whale and the finback, along with the gray, humpback, and sperm, could now be pursued and killed from the safety of the ship by means of the deadly harpoon cannon. At first, the whales were towed to shore processing stations, but by 1930-31, the industry hit its peak with 41 factory ships roaming the oceans of the world, each with a fleet of fast, efficient catcher ships. Every 14 minutes, a whale dies. No species of whale has ever been harvested on a sustained yield basis. And so the whaling industry is almost finished. Most of the nations of the world have all but given up the hunt. The blue whale, the largest creature ever to inhabit the earth, has joined the bowhead and right whale on the endangered species list. The gray whale and the humpback have been on the list for several years, and time is running out for the rest of the whales still being hunted. And as the nations of the world debate the fate of the whale, the native Eskimo of Alaska and Siberia still stand beside the lead edge patiently waiting for the bowhead whale, as they have for centuries past. There aren't as many whales now, but the Eskimos are still allowed to hunt with their traditional methods. The Eskimos wait with a patience born of generations of hunters. The whale is much too far out from the edge of the ice. For any chance of success, the whale must surface to breathe within a few hundred yards from the edge of the sea ice. For the skin boat can only be propelled by paddle or the whale would be frightened away. The weapons for killing are also traditional, with one exception, the explosive head that can be fired by means of a gun. But the Eskimo hunters prefer to get a harpoon into the whale first with a line attached to a float in case the whale sinks. The harpoon is hand thrown, but it also has one modern refinement. When the harpoon head is driven into the whale, this rod sets off a trigger, firing this explosive missile deep into the whale. The line attached to the harpoon is in turn tied to the float. It sounds dangerous, and it is, for one mistake could pull a man to his death or spill the entire crew into the deadly cold water. The Eskimos cover the float because of their belief that whales can see color and might be frightened away. The explosive head now does the actual killing of the whale, which in the old days would have been accomplished by driving lances again and again deep into the whale until it finally died. 
Now that the bowhead whale is protected, questions are being raised about whether or not the hunt should be terminated. But the plea of the Eskimo is, the bowhead whale is to us what the buffalo was to the Plains Indian. Take away our right to hunt the whale, and you destroy what is left of our culture. It was the white men's technology that almost destroyed the bowhead whale. But ironically, it's this same technology that enables us to enter the world of the living whale. Not to destroy, but to pursue knowledge. Knowledge that Scott hopes will lead to an appreciation and love for the bowhead whale and all his kind. It was very encouraging to find some open water and signs of life, but these cracks were 50 miles out to sea. They were not a part of the lead system that would open up along the edge of the Sharfast ice, the destination of our ice crew. The sea ice is one of the most hostile places on earth for man. Yet there is life here, beautifully designed to live and flourish along the edge of the ever-shifting ice. A blood stain on the ice marks the place of birth of two seal pups, possibly moments before we arrived. If you look closely, you can even see the trail of blood left by the pups as they crawled away from the afterbirth. Clear weather during our first week was great for flying, but was not the kind of weather that breaks open the lead that the whales need for their journey north. Far to the south, we found what we were looking for. This was the lead that would eventually break open beside our ice camp.
The boredom of endless waiting for the lead to open beside the ice camp was somewhat relieved by listening in with the hydrophones to the life below. Oh, that's fantastic. It's like a symphony down there. Especially the strange and eerie sound of the bearded seal. Our frustrated divers decided to get in some practice in a small crack in the ice that ran along beside our camp. If we were to be successful in getting into the water with the whales, the men would have to know in advance what the problems might be. There's a current. I can see it. The first thing we wanted to know was what the visibility down there would be like. Obviously, you can't film a bowhead whale if you can't see it. As Steve's tricky little measuring device disappeared into the murky depths at the 25-foot mark, we realized we had a problem. Despite the enthusiasm of our divers, nobody really believed that they would be able to get within 25 feet of a bowhead whale. Steve concluded that as soon as the cracks open, the sunlight causes the plankton to bloom, which cuts down the visibility. Joe and Rick began their swim tied to a tether. They wanted to be sure that the currents were not strong enough to pull them under the ice. There was also some concern that a crack might close over, trapping the men below. The strange and eerie realm of the bowhead whale. But a jellyfish was the first sign of life other than plankton that Joe and Rick had seen. It wasn't too long before they began to feel very much at home. Both Rick and Joe are wearing dry suits, which are much warmer than wetsuits in conditions like this. They found they could remain in the water for about an hour without too much discomfort. In fact, they seem to be having an easier time of it in the 28 degree water than Steve with his plankton specimens in the sub-zero air. No, screw it. Right. We can't do it. We invited a couple of Homer's seal hunting friends who passed through camp to listen in on their prey on our hydrophones. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> the Eskimos knew right away that the sounds they heard were from Ugrak, the seal. When we asked them if they had ever heard it before, they replied, Oh, yes. Uh, we, we used to, uh, you know, put, put the uh, pat, wooden paddle into the water and put it against our ear. That way we can hear the different types of animals that we want to go to hunt. Uh, my people have heard it for 4,000 years. <laughs> How about that? 4,000 years to hear. We, we think we got a big thing because we got some junk here. We we couldn't help but admire their sense of freedom with their beat-up old rifles, a handful of shells, and a knowledge of the dangerous sea ice acquired over countless generations. It takes a half an hour to do a dish out here. I know, it really takes some time. Listen, I tell you what, with this, with this crew, we should forget dishes and use a trough. <laughs> with this food. <laughs> Finally, the storms came, and we desperately hoped that the wind would open up the shore lead. Day after day, the wind blew, and we waited. Gee, I don't know, Rick. Uh, until that wind changes, we're not going to get anything out here. 
no, uh, the ice is just piling up against the shore. You know, there's no way that ice is going to open up until the wind changes. Fantastic. I sure hope the chopper can find something. With a little bit of luck, the lead is going to break open right here. I hope it doesn't break open behind us. <laughs> you can be both. How long can you tread water? <laughs> The helicopter was based at a dewline station because it would be impossible to start it without a source of power to keep the engine warm. a promising looking lead to the south and then at last we saw our first evidence of the presence of whales. We were sure the breathing holes were made by whales, possibly beluga, a small pure white arctic whale about 16 feet long. We suspect that these strange patterns are the impressions left by sleeping or resting beluga. The ice forms over their backs as they sleep then when they swim away, the impression is left in the ice. Look! There are beluga, they're actually resting. Hey! They're resting or sleeping. And ice is formed over their backs. And then when they swim away, an impression is left in the ice. Here they go! Look, look over there! Whoa! Wait, hey, look at the ice! Well, we hadn't found the bowheads yet, but at least we'd found whales. This was a good sign because bowhead often travel in the company of beluga. The adults are pure white, and if you look closely, you can see the gray calves following close in beside their mothers. Beluga have to surface to breathe about every five or six minutes. In a small hole or crack, they take turns in a sort of a crisscross pattern, surfacing many times before finally diving to swim under the ice to another hole. Hey, you guys, I saw a bowhead. Look, just in to the left there. Which hole? I saw it. I'm sure I saw a bowhead. Just a great calf. No, I saw it. I know I saw it. Jim, just hold it for right near. Okay. I'm getting it. I'm getting it. He's got to be down there. Jim, swing it to the left. Okay, Bill, how's this? There. Is he? There he is. I told you. See? There I told you. He he is. Down there. A bowhead and a halo of belugas. Look at him. Can you move in on that? You want me to keep Jim? Just, just, just bring him down a little lower. The Eskimos were right. Look at that blow. They are people have ever seen a bowhead whale alive. What little is known of them is best told through the words of an 18th century whaling captain, William Scoresby. When the mouth is open, it presents a cavity as large as a room and capable of containing a merchant ship's jolly boat full of men, being six or eight feet wide, 10 or 12 feet high, and 15 or 16 feet long. So impressive is the bowhead whale that we find that even a whaler like Scoresby was not without compassion for the whale. 
the maternal affection of the whale is striking. On June 1811, one of my harpooners struck a suckling young whale. Presently, the mother rose close by and seized the young by taking it under her fin. Inspired with courage and resolution by her concern for her offspring, she seemed regardless of the danger which surrounded her. At length, she was hit, but still she did not attempt to escape. There is something extremely painful in the destruction of a whale. Yet the value of the prize, the joy of the capture, cannot be sacrificed to feelings of compassion. For a detailed description of the bowhead, we again turn to the writings of Scoresby. The eyes are situated in the sides of the head, just above and behind the angle of the mouth. They are remarkably small in proportion to the animal's body. On the most elevated part of the head are situated the blowholes or spiracles, consisting of two longitudinal apertures six or eight inches in length. These are the proper nostrils of the whale. Our sightings of the bowhead whales did not occur in one flight, but were spread over a period of three weeks. We usually found them in the company of beluga. Years ago, it was discovered that the humpback whale has a voice and in fact sings. Eskimos have claimed that they have also heard the voice of the bowhead whale. Our next objective was to get our hydrophones into the water in sight of the whales and attempt to record them. Our problem was that while we can land on the sea ice, we can't turn the engine off because if we couldn't get it started again in the cold, there would be no chance of rescue with open water between us and shore. Fortunately, there was a great slab of rock jutting out from shore in the vicinity, so we decided to put her down on the solid shore fast ice at the base of the cliff. It's okay, but oh man, is that wind cold. I think I saw a seal. Yeah, there's a seal there. Let me get the hydrophone in the water and see what we're getting. We'll certainly get the seals and we'll see what other sorts of sounds we can pick up. Because we don't know what the bowhead whale sounds like, the only way to be sure we've got it is to actually be recording when the whales are in sight. We knew they were out there and coming our way. The question was, would they surface within sight? There he is, there he is, there he is. See those seals? Also Jess, Jess, listen over here. It's a little pop in the uh, lead over here. Look at this, look at this. Look at that
The sound of the bowhead was not what we had expected, but it was unmistakable in its contrast to the known sounds of the Arctic Springs, such as the bearded seal and the beluga. With only one last objective remaining, we decided that instead of waiting for the whales to come to our divers, we would take our divers to the whales. But it was not without considerable risk. Jim would have to drop us on the ice, then leave, so that the noise of the helicopter wouldn't scare off the whales. But if he ever lost sight of us, he might never find us again in this maze of jumbled ice. It soon became obvious that we had yet another problem. By the time we got the divers onto the ice and into the water, the whales would have been long gone. And there was just no way one could estimate where they might surface. Hey Jim, what do you say we pop Joe right on top? No way, baby. Listen, Joe, you'll be the first guy to ever get underwater shots. The big one-way dive, Bill. on those guys. It's impossible to film from a helicopter without causing a certain amount of distress in the animals. It's one of the things I hate about aerial photography. And of course, it's impossible to film the animal behaving naturally. And it's incredible to think that up until a few years ago, it was perfectly legal to shoot these creatures from aircraft for sport. This perversion of the sport of hunting is no longer legal. Beautiful, I got it! Damn, that was fantastic! That was smooth! I'm trying to remember what you did because it was perfect! With the prospects of filming Bowhead fast diminishing, we decided to try for Beluga. Hey, that's where I want to go, right down in there. It looks good, eh? Hey, yeah, they, they're, they're contained in there. Can we land you there? Our chances were much better for filming them because unlike the Bowhead, they cannot swim for fast distances under the ice. Okay, let's drop in there. That looks good. Yeah, looks good to me. No other holes the beluga can swim to. It's very dangerous. Our limit of three hours fuel supply put us on a strict time schedule, with one hour to get the divers into position on the ice, one hour to film with the helicopter flying around overhead in sight of the divers, and one hour to pick us up and make it back to base. Hey, the guy's fantastic. It's working. It's beautiful. 
do, do you want a tether, Joe? Yeah, let's get that tether on. Check the current here. I don't want to get swept on the Yeah, you guys, guys hang out of that blinking thing. Well, if, you, if there's no current, you can slip it off. We'll pull it in. Okay, fine. Let me check that valve, Joe. Okay, man, thanks. Hey, Chess, are uh, you getting anything on the uh, microphone? Oh, yeah, sure. No bowheads, though, eh? No bowheads? Okay, yeah. Rick, I'm going to back in. I'm going to back in slowly. Pay out the tether. Gee, the ice is thin. The visibility was very disappointing. The limit seemed to be about 30 or 40 feet, unless looking straight down. But Joe couldn't see any sign of the bluga. If he went to one end of the crack, they dove and swam to the other. And there seemed to be no way of closing the distance between them. But if Joe couldn't see the bluga, he could certainly hear them. That's the high chirping sounds. The other sound in the background is the bearded seal. I can't get near these dudes. We gotta try and trap them between us. It was decided to shed the tanks and swim with only the snorkels. A strategy was worked out where the divers would work from separate ends of the crack and attempt to catch the beluga between them. <laughs> the beluga see them, they'll die laughing. <laughs> Rick, the visibility is poor, but if we trip, we may be able to trap between us. I just see him for seconds at a time. Okay, listen, I'll start packing up my car. 
there's this great big black thing moving in. Over there! Oh, no. oh, oh, over there! Over there. there. Oh, oh, there. Oh, oh, I got the whole jump! Over there! Are you ready? It's almost impossible for us to comprehend the size and sheer bulk of a whale. But our brief encounter with the bowhead has reminded us that even though they are not built to our scale, they breathe, love, and suffer, and probably experience the sheer joy of being alive, just as we do. And we would have to agree with Scoresby that there is something extremely painful in the destruction of a whale. But how do we find the words to describe the slaughter that continues even today? A slaughter that has added all the great whales to the endangered species list. Our limited utilitarian attitude must be replaced by love and compassion for the leviathan of the seas, the bowhead whale, and all his kind.